I was very driven to do this stuff, much like I was very driven to do graffiti. I mean, graffiti was a way for disenfranchised, artistic feeling people to get out there and do something that they felt engaged with that was very special because it was not accessible. You would be arrested for doing this. In the graffiti culture that I was a part of, this was in some ways like a point of pride, like that you, you, had, to, you had to risk something to do this. And that was what, part of what made it special. This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the website builder with all the tools you need to create your own site to showcase and sell artwork. Hey guys, welcome to Proco. My name is Stan Prokopenko and we got Steven Bauman. We're in the studio surrounded by his drawing, stuff, yeah. his creation. He just recorded a demo of, what is it, 20 hours? 20 hour graphic. Yeah, at least 18, 19, somewhere on there. And yeah. we we're gonna be publishing it on proco.com slash Bauman. I can do everything. The whole process, well, working from life, yeah, it's a big theme in it. Materials, papers, stumps, erasers. Favorite pencil. My absolute favorite <laughs> mechanical pencil. That's the that's the the gem. Yeah, so at the if end you want to know the magic it. pencil, you have to you have to buy the. Yeah, you got to buy the whole thing, and then at the end, I go, listen, it's just this one. <laughs> it's just the number two. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's yeah. com slash Bauman. Now we're gonna just do a little bit of interviewing, talking. Some Q and A. Okay, I want to start by just kind of going through history, getting to know you. <sighs> yeah. So. Start at the beginning. I was born on a day, on a stormy day, July 13th. Were you? I, it could have been, I'm not sure. Oh, I thought that was But I was, no, I was actually, so I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, but uh, when I was about five months old, my family moved to Miami. Some people ask me where I'm from, where I'm from I just say Miami, because oh, it kind of makes that's sense. That's why you reacted that way when I mentioned Miami. Yeah. Like, uh, you, you lived there. Yeah, I, was, I spent about 18 years in Miami and it was, uh, yeah. it's Miami. Go to the beach. Go to go to the beach, in Miami. It's great. Yeah. Okay. So when did you get into drawing? Were you a kid that always liked to sketch, or did you? I think that you know when I was a kid, I I mean, if you really want the story of like what I drew when I was a kid, yeah. Like I would draw these like really elaborate little um, like military scenarios. I would uh, kind of animate them in a very well. I would I would erase this guy over here, and I would move him over to there. Are you and then I would the tactically move paper. soldiers like around this battlefield that's, that I created. Ooh, wow. <laughs> that's like my first experience of drawing. And then that turned into like drawing werewolves. And then that probably turned into after that, immediately after that, it was Bart Simpson. And then <laughs> immediately after that, it was graffiti writing. So, so it goes uh, battlefield tactical animations. Were they stick figures? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Helmets. Mm. After that, it was uh, werewolves. After that, Bart Simpson, graffiti, and then uh, I don't see a, a linear progression. Or I hit I hit a lot of different yeah. spots on the map. No, my brother was a graffiti writer, so I would go into his room and I would take his drawings and I would copy them. How much older was he? He's uh, six years older than me. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he was like kind of. Uh, very active in the graffiti world in the, in the 80s and I would kind of take his drawings and I'd copy them and... Was he active like at night? Like he's... he's he was seen, active um, like a graffiti writer is active. Like just you go out and you, you, you run away. And... That's what graffiti writers do. Yeah? Yeah. He was also a skateboarder so in a way like I kind of followed in his footsteps a bit. How do you um, make a living with that? With graffiti writing and skateboarding? No. No, I think you're like... Do you uh, have to be... Um, what's his face? Yeah. Bank Banksy. I would say that Banksy has probably digressed too far outside of what graffiti actually is yeah, to be a graffiti you, is writer. that the only way? Do you have to basically exit that world mm. to something else to make a living? Not anymore. Or graffiti, is graffiti art just not about that at all? Do you? I think just, that at its inception, graffiti was a way for disenfranchised, artistic feeling people to get out there and do something that they felt engaged with that was very special because it was not accessible. You would be arrested for doing this. And it was part of, in, in the graffiti culture that I was a part of, this was in some ways like a point of pride, like that you, you, had, to, you had to risk something to do this. And that was what, part of what made it special. And nowadays, um, a lot of graffiti writers from that generation have just gone into galleries and they kind of make the same work. And while I would never begrudge anybody like making a living from their art, I think that's great. 
we have to say probably it's not really graffiti exactly right right at least what graffiti was at its inception but they're doing the same thing pretty just, much yeah you know, not on a, on a wall but yeah on a and now there's another generation of artists graffiti artists that have come along and they've kind of grown up where graffiti was like uh, an acceptable acceptable kind of visual medium for like art galleries and some of them go straight into that mm -hmm. which again i think is great go for it expand the the the, the world of that visual world it's missing that that critical component that is being illegal. Why did you get into the illegal part of art? Like, was there something about your childhood that made you? We're getting deep well. Deep. Everybody's everybody's a bit of a rebel when they're young. I think I I was no different from that. Probably just the influences around. I mean, my brother was a graffiti writer. You know, once you start kind of like looking around at the world through that lens you know, it's easy to kind of become a part of it, right? Like I'd be riding around in the car with my parents and I wouldn't be looking at whatever shop windows, I'd be looking at the graffiti that was like in the alleyways. Like that was what was interesting to me. And so it wasn't anything that I needed to ask someone's permission to be a part of. It wasn't something with a barrier of entry that I couldn't, I couldn't get over, right? So I just dove into it. By the way, this is not a do illegal graffiti commercial. Like that's not at all a part <laughs> is, of what I'm we're saying. We're getting to know your history, yeah. where, where this all became. So then like, of course, if you're a person who is like driven to do things, then you, you try and get better at it. You try and do more of it. In that world, there was the, the prospect of fame, right? And loosely described, you could say it was when other graffitis, uh, graffiti writers hear your tag or whatever, they know you. you go, oh yeah, I've seen that here, here, and here. By writing as many different places as you could in as prominent a place as you could get it in, as noticeable a place as you could be, that increased your level of fame in a sense, yeah. right? Uh, so it was just about being known. That's what you wanted. And also you wanted to be known probably with the connotation that you were good, like your style was good. Yeah. Um, and so you'd get really strategic about it. You'd, you'd go buy spots. Like I went to school in downtown Miami for four years and there were spots that I would, I would walk by every day and I'd just be thinking, oh, I gotta find a time for that one. Okay, so why'd you choose to leave that world and be more of a fine art? Guy. I was in I was in high school and still really really active uh, writing graffiti. But I had an art teacher in high school. Um, he was not very straight laced. He was a very kind of out there guy. Um, introduced me to a lot of really music that I that I really blew my mind at the time. You know, informed me that by the way, like you know, you like to obviously I like to draw a lot. I was constantly drawing in my my sketchbooks and things. Um, and he knew that that I was a graffiti writer and you know. Uh, was the single adult probably in my life that didn't chastise me or completely uh, uh, shame me for, for doing yeah. so. But he informed me that, you know, like people can go, people can study art. You can actually go to college for art. And I had, at the time, I don't know that I really made that connection, you know, just in terms of like looking at this as something that I do in my life. I was just a kid, you know, kind of writing graffiti. And then between that and there was, there was a movie actually at the time, which knowing your your deep, deep knowledge of all filmmaking in the last 50 years, yeah. I know that you'll know. The, uh, there was a film by a director called Julian Schnabel uh, about Jean-Michel Basquiat, okay. who was uh, like a graffiti writer in the 1980s in New York. But he was very much on the artistic end of the spectrum of graffiti writing. I mean, it was nominally graffiti, mostly it was like art in a way on walls. And so I guess that was where the first like connection in my head started thinking like, you know, I remember at the time my graffiti changed from like primarily just being about words to like, I just started drawing faces, characters, figures on walls. And the natural extension then was, for me anyway, to become kind of figurative. And I think also there was, there was a thing about the graffiti world where quality matters immensely. Mm -hmm. And people are not shy in any way, shape or form about telling you you don't have that quality. So you work really hard to get really, really good at it. Yeah. And so when I kind of entered the, the kind of fine art world, when you think about having skill, like graffiti writers, it's a lot about skill. Uh, so when you think about how, like what artistic discipline requires you to really hone a skill and a craft and a style, well, it's, it's, it's representational work, right? So I started getting into figurative work and portraiture and things through that. Um, and then while I was at college, I eventually heard about the, the Florence Academy. You know, I did printmaking, I did painting, 
uh, figure drawing classes. And by the time I'd finished all of those, I think I had like two academic courses left to get my associate's degree. And by this time, like I, there was, I knew what I was going to do. I wasn't going to go into, um, I don't know, some other field where liberal arts degrees would be accepted. I was going to be a painter in one yeah. form or another. Um, so I just left and I, I just went to my studio to paint. I went back yeah. to Miami, got a studio, uh, lived in it for uh, a couple of years until I went to the Florence Academy. So that high school teacher that you said that mm -hmm. kind of shifted your, yeah. your path a little bit. Well, if he was not teaching there, what do you think you'd be doing? Man. Uh, at the time, my family was uh, less than subtly encouraging me to go to the military. Um, because I didn't really, again, I didn't, I'm sure from their side, I wasn't really exhibiting anything <laughs> Any that, promise. that like said, oh, just go to UCLA or go, you know. Yeah, go become to a Ivy doctor. League. Yeah, like that wasn't, they probably didn't have much ex expectation about that. Uh, for me, but I was again. I was just really kind of deep into this kind of graphic world, and uh, and I just wanted to draw, and I just wanted to do that stuff. And in some ways, like the the singularity of of that interest helps because you're either going to get really good at this thing, or you're not going to be good at anything. Yeah. So I dove in like completely uh, in that time. And when I went to Florence, it wasn't like I'll go to Florence and I'll try to have a life as well, and I'll do I have family and this and that. It was just live in a basement, live in the studio, like just be there constantly. And that was, again, you know, an asset, you know, that was maybe rough at the time, but, but it was an asset later. Okay, so how long were you at Florence then? Uh, I went there in 2004 and I, I technically studied for four years. When I was uh, in my third year studying, I started becoming, I was a student teacher. And then after my four years of study, they hired me as a principal instructor. Two more years in Florence after that. So I think it was about six years in Florence in total, but four of them as a student, mm -hmm. which is, seems like a long time, but it's the blink of an eye when you're yeah. trying to get good at like drawing the figure and painting the figure. It's, I mean, there's such a deep well of knowledge that you have to assimilate that uh, by the end of four years, you know, I had the equipment, but you have to like build expertise with that equipment too. What do you think are some of the things that are different about the Florence Academy from other representational schools? Uh, it might be important to narrow the focus a little bit because, I mean, you could say that, you know, there's a lot of universities that have, like, a rep they have figure drawing classes. Yeah, but, but at that level, difference? you well, actually, well, I could, I mean, that's going to be eventually a little bit of a scathing one because, yeah. you know, to understand that to, like, draw the figure well, you know, we work with the figure three hours a day, or five hours a day, actually, five days a week at the Florence Academy for, for, for the entire time of there. Most people, three years. I was there four years. And that's just to get good at getting a single nude figure resolved on a canvas or on a piece of paper. I remember when I went to college, right, my figure drawing class was one semester. We met maybe two times a week. Uh, and we had, you know, our long pose was two hours. Your long pose at the Florence Academy is 75 hours. Um, so the difference is like, that's a big difference. I, what's bigger than night and day? Like what's, you know, what's the bigger difference that you can kind of create? Now there's a lot of atelier based schools now, and even there's some universities where the figurative programs are really yeah. evolving. And so, um, there, there are great situations to study, I'm sure outside the Florence Academy. There's a few, Yeah, but yeah, most are probably like what you described yeah. where it, it's not as disciplined as, not even close as, as yeah. the Florence Academy. And the real, the real tough thing about it is that people go through those classes. And I remember going through those classes and going, I just can't really draw the figure, you know, like I, I had my two hours and I didn't get it. So I, <laughs> it's just, I just, I'm not, maybe I'm not like cut out to, yeah. to, to be, you know, a great figurative draftsman. Well, was it that short because they were, were going more for just the, like an impression of it and not actually trying to study the human form or study light and you know, or like, well, like, what was the what was the main focus of what they were trying to teach you in those two hours? Looking back on it, it's so frustrating because <laughs> no, like the ways yeah. that that concepts were presented were always through like something very superficial. Like they'd look at tonal drawing and they would talk about the marks, not that a tone is meant to represent a plane that's meant to right. represent form. They go, look, it's the drawing is so rough. You know, and you go, okay, so rough, I draw rough. But no, like, that's not, like, that's the superficial, that's the, like the, the symptom, not the, not the cause, you know what I mean?
But if I look back on it and I think, you know, why was the class taught in that way? I, I think it's probably because the well-meaning people who were teaching it were not necessarily that invested in figurative art mm -hmm. or probably they had studied with in a school where figurative art was um, trending downwards yeah. uh, as most of it was in the kind of, you know, mid century, right? Well, what was the promise of the school? Did they say you were going to teach you how to draw the figure? Or was it, it was out? just big A art school. Like it art was school, just, just, you're gonna learn just art going to art school. Okay. And you're going to well, learn maybe different the stuff. There is no focus. A little and bit, so yeah. I mean, kind of just does whatever they feel like is important to yeah. art. And again, I can't say enough. The, guy, the guys and women that were teaching there are really nice people and very well meaning. But now, that, like from having studied at an atelier based school, understanding that that's how you get good at representational painting and drawing, you know, it's just not enough actually. Mm -hmm. um, you need a long, long time to build up like the series of different things necessary to be like knowledge and experience basis necessary to be like a good figurative artist. So when you were at Florence, was your schedule pretty much just, you were just always drawing? Mm -hmm. Pretty or much. Were you working on your own projects at all or was it all just the, the projects or not projects, but the assignments? from class. I think it'd be more pr correct probably to call them projects, yeah. Because oh, you have, like, you start out, you have, like, say, during the term you have your one long, or you have the, the first half of the term you have one long pose, right? Mm -hmm. So this is your 75 hour drawing, you're doing it for five weeks, three hours a day, five days a week. And so that's one project that you're working on. Then you're usually, in the beginning, you're working on, like, a master copy. So you have, mm -hmm. like, a oh, lithograph okay. like this, and you're doing, like, kind of a one-to-one, millimeter-to-millimeter copy of that of that drawing and you're working with instructors every day um, and those instructors are there kind of unpacking some of the ideas that are present in yeah. those in those drawings um, in the model room you're getting constant feedback about your design accuracy values um, concepts that you want to work with things like that I mean it differs kind of year to year because of the, the the different kinds of projects you're doing your first probably First year and a half I was there I just spent drawing I was doing pencil and charcoal drawings and then after that I started oil paint and then um, but what most of that was for school work uh, projects yeah for school or did you come home and you're like I kind of want to draw this other thing mm. did you ever do that always yeah okay I mean it, like I lived in you know various ramshackle apartments uh, throughout Florence which is actually very easy to do at the time by the end of the time I was there I think it was like living in a basement for about 200 euro a month it's a terrible apartment uh, but it was the reason I was able to get through my life third and fourth year because the rent was so low. Uh, but I'd go there and I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd do like little oil portraits and things like in the night with a really terrible halogen lamp and everything. Just Is that why you wear glasses now? Probably. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I mean, it was just, I, I was very driven to do this stuff, much like I was very driven to do graffiti. I mean, I think it's just probably genetic nature and nurture, but like I just wanted to get good at stuff. And so I did it all the time because I never felt like it was quite as good as it should be, you know? Do you look at back at that time as like a positive thing? Like, oh, those, those good old days. Or was it like, man, that was tough. I, I, I don't want to do, live through that again. Uh, wow, I mean, by the way, I, I, there's no other way I would have rather spent my 20s than like studying art in Florence. Preparing like it was, I mean, <laughs> no, but I mean, it was great, right? Like, I, you know, I, I remember being aware at the time that while I was in this apartment on, like in this street in the center of Florence called Via Ghibellina, um, I had a little like walk up and uh, I remember in the morning eating my like cereal for breakfast and just watching my breath like from the winter, like the, the condensation from my breath while I'm like eating breakfast with an electric radiator like between my knees, mm -hmm. like trying to stay relatively warm. So like the experience was was really, really tough physically. I remember being aware at the time that like this is I'm going to be so happy that that like yeah. this is how I spent my 20s. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, I would I would totally do it over again. Yeah, but wouldn't I wish to be a little bit warmer. <laughs> you wouldn't but. bring the, that on to yourself right now. Oh God, no! I mean, I'm 38. <laughs> you wouldn't choose. That. I would be like, oh, I don't know, man. I need to. I need a more comfortable apartment than those. Did you have a social life? If by social life you mean beer drinking on the steps of a church on Fridays, then yes. By yourself. I had a rich social life. <laughs> no, like in Florence, right? There's no uh, open container laws like in the city. So when people want to have a beer, or whatever, they go to the piazza, and usually around the the various like squares, piazzas, 
in the city you have like a cathedral or whatever, right? So you have like Santa Croce Cathedral and it's got its steps and everybody sits on the steps and has a smoke and has a drink and like chats. It's actually very normal. It sounds like in Amer with American ears, it sounds very like, you know, racy to like be drinking beer on the steps of a church. But like that was the kind of extent of a social life probably it was just going to the, the pub on Friday or whatever, going to the church steps and having a beer. So you go to the grocery store and buy a warm bottle of beer yeah. or like maybe uh, like 60 centesime, so like a cent. And then you'd go to the, the steps and just drink it, get really tired and go home. Huh. It's exciting, right? <laughs> Other people who were not in my dire financial situation would go out to a restaurant and have a really nice meal and stuff. But okay. I was, uh, I was not. You know. Did you go do that with your classmates? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know. I thought you maybe you just went out on your own and you just like hung out with people that were also on the steps. No, no, no. Okay. No. So you went there with your friends. Yeah. And you guys yeah. hung out. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You should have phrased it like that. Sorry. I went out with my friends and we hung out on the steps. Yes. But then well, also, you know, I would do I would do night bikes as well. Like, night bikes? Yeah, like I would, because my apartment was, was by the end it was so bad. Like like sleeping in the winter time was really really tough. I couldn't sleep till uh, I don't know really really late at night. So I just go out and like bicycle around the city until I was exhausted. The cool thing was is that at like three in the morning, Florence is just completely empty. Yeah. Um, so you, you just ride around the city like you're the only person alive in it, and that was great. And I'd be exhausted. I'd go home and fall asleep eventually, but. There's, cool. a, there's a no, lot of really? Florentine stories, yeah, yeah, like that. Hmm. Gives a lot of insight into you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then what? So at the point at that point in time, the the system was that advanced students who were doing really well um, would potentially be invited to be a student instructor. Mm -hmm. As soon as I realized that was a thing, I was completely set on that happening, and so I just followed the path of, you know. How do, you, how do you get to that? Mm. And to get to that, you just, you chain yourself to your easel at the studio. You're constantly there. You're constantly working. You go to all the evening classes you can go to. And you, you just, you try and make the work as quality as you can in the best way that you know how and the best way that your instructors are able to, to, to help you to make. Mm. I did that. The, my second year, I got a cleaning scholarship. So I was cleaning bathrooms, which I was excited to do. <laughs> it's like, yes, I got a cleaning scholarship at the Florence Academy. It was the most exciting thing ever. Is it because you got a job at the Florence Academy or because it paid well? Because it was a scholarship. It was a recognition that like I was doing well. They don't give, they don't let bad. <laughs> Congratulations. They don't let bad draftsmen clean their bathrooms at the Florence Academy. So I was really <laughs> excited. They want them that. really clean. You know, just attention to detail. Yeah. And then the third year, um, I, I got a, a teaching assistant scholarship. That was, again, I thought, you know, I was on over the moon happy about that. Like, I couldn't have been happier. So cleaning scholarship means you clean and you get to take classes for free? You or get uh, an amount off of your tuition. Okay. They like to try and help talented, driven people stay at the school because it's expensive. It's in Europe. I had probably no business being there in the first place, just with those two first criteria, right? Yeah. Um, but I got there and, and a lot of people... Daniel Graves and Susan Tintori, who run the academy, between them and like my art teacher in high school, I owe them like everything. In terms of just, the, you know, they gave me the chance to do all this stuff without those scholarships, without well, the existence of the school, you know, this stuff just doesn't happen. So, I mean, I'll always be really, really grateful about that. And all, of course, all the people that, that all the teachers there that, that help you along the way as well. It's just, um, it's a really great community. And, and I just, I feel incredibly fortunate to have like gone through it. Uh, in particular at the Florence Academy as well. How many people get the cleaning scholarship a year? Uh, I think each studio has to be cleaned once a day. And if you have a clean scholarship, you're doing it twice a week. So it's like usually two people or something like that um, uh, per studio. The school was then comprised of like four studios. There was three drawing and painting studios and one sculpture studio. So each one had two, potentially three cleaners. So eight to ten, maybe. something like that. Yeah, yeah. out of like maybe a hundred students. Okay. And then you had probably a similar number of student teachers, but those usually thirty-year students um, would would start being a, um, if you were going to become a student teacher. Yeah. Usually happens in your third year. Student teacher, my third year, um, I was over the moon about it. Couldn't have been. So what's the difference there? So are you getting paid at that point? No, it's still money off the tuition. And yeah. just a little more money off the tuition. A little more money off the tuition. Yeah, yeah. And then also, you know, the really cool thing about it is that. That one, like, of course, you get to kind of codify your, your reflections about the education by working with other people on understanding it, right? Yeah, yeah. teaching is one of the best um, ways to learn. And then because you're an assistant, 
like you're going to assist one of the one of the teachers that's been there longer. I was actually working with Simona Dolce, who's the, the director of the drawing program there. But so we used to hang out a lot, and you know, again, that was a really huge influence on me. Also, like being uh, like Florentine, she had a much different perspective about art, and in particular, like classical figurative art, than really anybody else that that I'd talked to. You know, it's kind of a hundreds of years perspective rather than a you know who's painting the best dollar primas right now kind of perspective. So she was really full of wisdom, and and uh, again, it was a great. It was just great to be able to kind of absorb all that and work with her in her studio and stuff. It was it was wonderful because she was the the kind of head of the drawing department, and I was assisting her on her teaching day. Yeah. So we'd have lunches together. We'd talk together. Eventually, I'd work with her in the studio and stuff. So you were there for f- five years or so. Six. Six years. Four years a student. Two years after. Six years. And then okay. the motorino exhaust fumes and the sounds of the city just yeah. became a little bit too much. Oh, but that, well, then you became just full-on teacher for two years. Yeah. Right. So then, what did you teach? What was your first class? Um, well, the the way that the Florence Academy is organized, it's it's just about uh, programs. So you have the drawing program, you have yeah. the painting program, sculpture program. You go through the program. So it's not like it's individual a, classes. Yeah. Yeah. You have to just. Take the classes that are, are yeah, like your the fig- next like one. figure drawing you do for all the time that you're going to be in the drawing department. Then you move to painting, you just work with the figure in paint. Okay. Um, so it's not like you're not doing a portrait class and then this kind of class and that term, that kind of class. The figure runs from day one to the last day. And then maybe in your, in your individual studios, you'll go from copying lithographs to plaster casts to still life to, uh, or to painting plaster casts to still life and then to portraiture. Okay. So they start with a, a live model from day one. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, oh, okay. Because there's some schools that start with casts yeah. for like the first year and just mm-hmm. no, no live models at all, just casts. Yeah. Then once you're comfortable drawing from something that doesn't move, yeah. studying form, then you move on to a live model and you try to like yeah. capture that. But I would like that. Yeah, day one, they toss you in. It's, I mean, the, there's a good argument on either side of that, yeah. you know. I mean, I kind of respect both sort of trajectories, but what we did at the academy was, yeah, day one, figure drawing. Okay, so then you started teaching the figure drawing portion of that? Yeah, thing? like when I, was, when I was hired on as a teacher, like uh, as a, what you call it, like a principal instructor, I was yeah. teaching in the drawing program. Actually, I taught in the drawing program all throughout my time in Florence. Okay. Um, I think I, they sent me for a term over to the painting studio. I taught there for a little while, and then I taught um, back in the, the drawing program. Uh, we spent, spent six years in Sweden. It was a really great time. Um, and then, I don't know, it's just time for a new adventure. When you came here, is that when you got on Instagram? I was sitting in the office in Sweden uh, chatting with um, the, the administrator there. Uh, something about Instagram came up, and, and I didn't have an account. Yeah. I'd never really even thought about it. So I said, oh, okay, I'll do an account. I've, I've thought a number of times about why, like, why I have as many followers. I don't know exactly why, like... Shut up! No, 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 no. But like, <laughs> great pain- there are great painters, there are amazing artists that don't have a massive Instagram following. So, so after, like, the first few posts, you were, you're at 20,000? By the time I had, like, 15, 20 posts, I was probably... I was, I was getting, like, quite up there. And, and I just... Yeah. Each one of these is... is is amazing. So I, I'm pretty sure that one or two of these probably just got onto like the the recommended page or something. Back then, the recommended, like the trending pages, were I, I think that they they were filtered in a way that was much more direct. Yeah, but that's you you, you post quality work like that regularly, and you yeah. you're gonna hit a few that just shoot you up. Not not at first, actually. I, like I said, when I got to New York, I started taking it seriously because I was like getting around like 70, 80,000 followers. And I was like, maybe, maybe this is a way that I can, maybe this can do something, you know? Maybe I can, you know, it can be a part of my art career. Were books a big part of your studying? Or was it all about you go to class, live model, you draw, that's it. Or did you study theory through books? Ah, studying theory through books. Yeah. You, well, you have to read, uh, when you get to the Florence Academy, you have to read uh, The Practice and Science of Drawing by Harold Speed. Okay. Um, this is a book that, that everybody kind of, uh, at the very least, leafs through. Um, you know, it has a, a lot of really fascinating ideas. Everybody looks at Van Der Poel's classic book on, on figure drawing. As far as like where the theory came from, it was very much one-to-one with your instructors. Um, because while these books did expound ideas that we were working with, 
Um, it's not that the school was a synth synthesis of any of those, or the school's education was not a synthesis of any of those books in particular. So we had our own kind of aesthetic idea um, that was maybe based around maybe, you know, studying very well, like Velasquez's ideas about sort of optical impression and Sargent's ideas about... Where did you study that? Well, I mean museums, but it, through conversation mm -hmm. with your instructors. Right? Oh, okay, got it. Um, so what they're trying to do is like uh, give you informative concepts that explain the visual ideas that these artists were, were practicing. Mm -hmm. and, and through emulation and, and, and the sort of internalization of those theories, this is how you eventually came to, to understand your practice. Again, books were great, books were useful, but they were not as critical to the curriculum as one-on-one -on -one instruction. That's why whenever the, the, the third most in popular question on the internet comes up, what books do you recommend for people starting out? I was out? about to ask. Uh, <laughs> there are several books that are very good. Harold Speed's yeah, Practice in Science books. of Drawing. Harold Speed did an oil painting book as well. Um, Vanderpool's book on drawing is really good. Yeah. Um, if you, you know, if you want to learn about anatomy, obviously proco.com is fantastic. Um, but you can go to, uh, you can read, you know, Goldfinger's text on, on anatomy, Richet's text on anatomy. Maybe beyond those five, I'm sure that there are several others that are interesting that I haven't read. But again, you need yeah. to be in it, doing it to like grasp what this book is talking about. Think about like watching a documentary about mountain climbing and then going mountain climbing. That you wouldn't say that one meant you've experienced it. So read the books, but you know, read them while you're on a model break in the studio, yeah. working from life. So in the Florence Academy, it was all sight size? Yeah, all the observation is done um, standing up in the model room, uh, vertical drawing boards, vertical canvases, and you're working with this system of observation called sight size. It has very specific mechanics, and you learn those mechanics uh, early on, mm -hmm. and you practice them throughout your, your time there. Uh, it's very versatile, but there are other kind of secondary educations that I've taken on my own that have actually led me a little bit in a, in a different direction, right? Like studying a lot of anatomy, um, it was necessary for me to draw a lot more rapidly uh, and actually to incorporate um, a lot more use of like constructive halftones than would be consistent with maybe like a Florence Academy drawing approach. So at that point, like in my personal work also, I started kind of diverting away from that a bit. Even though, like, again, I feel like it's probably one of the most efficient teaching tools. Just like, ways of it? training your eye. Yeah, because it's the, the way that size size works is you have your impression of the size of the model at this point in your cone of vision is met exactly by your drawing board, which is bisecting your cone of vision. Yeah. So you have a one-to-one -one example, right? Mm -hmm. And there's nowhere to hide. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Your tilt of the shoulders is wrong. Your, your, your width of the pelvis is wrong. The size of your head is wrong. It's, it could not be more clear to you. Yeah. And so for that reason, like it's really demanding and very rigorous. And that's great for students. You, okay, you obviously have strayed away from it or you, you don't really care. It's not a part of you my practice You don't need to right use now. it. Yeah. You, could, you could or you could just or not. Yeah. Obviously, you didn't for this one. No. Um, when you transitioned, yeah. was there any difficulty? in drawing yeah. more oh, there was sure. so you had to yeah. train yourself to yeah. not do side size i had to train myself in some of the things that are not as necessary in sight size when you're working in sight size you can really rely upon a lot on your measurement and immediate comparison to yeah. create construction so if you, your entire sort of shoulder chest area is just bait washed in light you can really draw a lot of that just from the contours of it and maybe the shadow edge Mm -hmm. The reality is that if you're sketching that, those contours are way too far apart for you to have any rational connection. So what you need to do if you're sketching is you need to work with the pit of the neck, the center line, connect you know, the clavicles to that, which bring you out to the top of the shoulders, which brings you to the deltoids, which shows you where the pectorals are, which brings you back to the center line, right? So all of this stuff gets connected that way. In sight size, it's not immediately necessary to do that. And so I started kind of you know, training from this anatomical standpoint, building the body together through, through anatomy. Once you did start getting out, mm -hmm. out of sight size, like mm -hmm. what did you have to do mm -hmm. in order to get more comfortable doing something like this? Yeah, it was, it was all about using like both anatomy and basically halftone planes to kind of uh, construct believable volumes, right? Okay. And, and to try and become, uh, 
uh, very specific early on using those because I wasn't using any any almost any kind of measurements. I might do a little bit of a comparative height versus width, mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, I was just relying on connecting together the shapes and bony points that I that I could observe, yeah. and and using my understanding of maybe like the logic of the body, right? So if you think about structural symmetry, uh -huh. even if I'm looking at a body and foreshortening, I can understand that I should like there's a clavicle here, a clavicle here. If I can create that alignment appropriately, I can show the foreshortening partially through that. I can show the deltoid here versus here. I can, you know what I mean? So yeah. you're using all that, that knowledge and, and also sketching a lot through the form. So you're using a lot of like what are essentially values. Even if it doesn't appear to be something like dark on the light of your shoulder, I might actually go and kind of outline the deltoid and kind of create that shape up there. Mm -hmm. Just because constructively it's very useful to me, which is a very non-visual thing. It's very conceptual, right? right? Um, but that was something that we didn't really do in sight size. It was really, really super visual, all about the impression. Right. Um, so I was going to a place where I thought, well, visually, this is not a part of the world that I'm seeing, but constructively, I know it's useful. So I really had to kind of embrace that, that knowledge. Okay. Thinking more about structure rather than the illusion of mm -hmm. what you were seeing. Yeah. Okay. Now, this could also be a little bit just a feature of my education. I mean, it's not that we don't talk about halftones and structure at the front. Of course, we talk about it constantly. But I, probably in the hierarchy, there is impression, and then this comes after it. Yeah. So to become an expert at it, I needed to, I feel like, focus a lot. How, what do you think is good artwork? How do you judge artwork? Wow, Stan. Boom! <laughs> Deep! <laughs> <laughs> How do you, what is good? Oh, man. No, you, to you. I don't, I don't think, I'm not saying like... I'm going to have to start disagreeing with premises here. I don't know, necessarily agree with the premise of the conversation. How, how do you judge artwork? Well, this what do you is like? not, it's not like binary. It's not like there's good and bad art. That, like, that includes a categorization that I just don't... What do you strive for? Okay. See, there's a question I can get on board with. In my art, for, for me, I think when I turned professional, I started to become a professional artist, I'm definitely inspired, but I'm not inspired every day. Not everybody's like, inspiration is not a thing that it perpetually lives within you. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the inspiration you find in the work, in the craft, in the day-to-day, -day, in the materials that you're using, um, your exploration of those materials, using those to the best that you possibly can. So a lot of what, I, I, I'm passionate about in, in the work is um, being able to access whatever notes I need to hit to make the kind of song that I'm trying to make, right, so to speak. That entails like a lot of times, you know, I'll work in different mediums for a while. I'll, I'll work in watercolor, I'll work in gouache, I'll work in, uh, I'll even experiment with colored pencils. All of these things kind of, you know, eventually congeal into like a knowledge base um, that, that I use to make artwork that I, I think I really believe in, right? And sometimes it's just as simple as, is it beautiful? Is it elegant? Is the design okay. succinct? You know, if you look at this, is there any wasted space, any wasted energy? Have I made this, this portrait like everything that I could make this portrait? Yeah. That entails along with it, I think necessarily, my feeling about it. These are all my choices my taste. So when I think about my art or my artistic expression, uh, it's not a statement. It's, it's more a product of every other thing that I do. What comes out of it is this expression. And I can't really put it in a nutshell, but I can say that, that when you look at the work itself, all of these things, all the years that I've spent compiling experiences and knowledge, all have gone into each one of these expressions. Yeah. Which creates a difficult circumstance because I can't say it's about this. It's about my life. The whole thing is everything that I've done leading up to this. It's about that. Yeah. So your work is mostly, or you put a lot of focus on just aesthetic appeal of mm -hmm. the piece. Yeah. Very much so, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's kind of, that kind of answers my first question too. Okay. It's like, yeah, how, it's what do you think is good art? narrative. Like, I'm not necessarily telling, sure. telling, yeah. stories or illustrating a story um, or, or a character in history, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a lot more, it's more just a, um, a combination, a long, 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 long equation, uh, the sum of which is that painting. It's not easy to say that I just try and make things succinct and beautiful. Yeah. 
that's tough to like, you know, you, you saw this horrible uh, pamphlet in the, in the cafeteria upstairs. How do you justify art? <laughs> okay, it's a horrible question. But if you asked me, I'd just have to say, I think beautiful things make people's lives better. Yeah. I think that living with beautiful design in your life makes your life experientially better. Mm -hmm. And I think that we accept that in so many other, other realms, you know. Why do you live in, in a building that was made by an architect, architect who, was, who was fantastic, a genius? Because they understood, understood space and how people live in that space. They crafted it and they honed it and they used all their skills and logic and knowledge and experience to make this place that fits people. I feel like I do that with, with drawings and paintings. I, yeah. I just use everything that I can to make this thing great, right, succinct. In this, I didn't understand that I could tell people that. I, didn't yeah. I don't think I understood that I could tell people the reason's not, it's not a simple one. It's a very complicated one. Yeah, no, I'm kind of in the same boat. Like I, with my own art, I have this, I, pressure on myself mm -hmm. to have more meaning to my artwork other than just make a pretty picture. Yeah. It's like, what, what's the purpose of it? Mm -hmm. How do you justify your art? That's stupider than yeah. like, do I need to inject meaning into it? Do it yeah. Like, does it need to teach somebody something? Mm -hmm. you know, as if mm -hmm. like, I, I should do that yeah. with my art, you know? So that's what you were maybe trying to do there is like, Trying to do something I think, more yeah, with it. I think I was searching for some kind of narrative that, that could give a reason for this to be here. Yeah. Um, when in fact, like, just a guy in front of a stormy background is probably enough. Yeah. So you, you, instead of being inspired by a message and then making an artwork for it, you were making an artwork and then trying to figure out what reason to give it. Or even, like, that I even felt it was necessary for a message to be there. Yeah. Like that's the, the idea at its inception is that I thought to make something that big, there has to be something there. There's something coherent in a nutshell that I can put in a sentence and say, well, it's about sleeping. All right, well then, um, what can we expect from you in the future and where can we find your stuff? Um, you can expect really well-crafted, finely honed, beautifully designed portraits and figurative work. Yeah. Uh, and you can find me at Stephen Baumann Artwork on Instagram, uh, Stephen Baumann Artwork on Patreon, uh, and uh, on Proco.com as soon as Brandon and your team get all this stuff wrapped up. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, Stan. Thanks, Stephen. That was great. You know what else is great? Getting your website up and running with Squarespace. Squarespace makes it easy for artists with no web design experience to build a professional looking site in no time. Their award-winning support team operates 24-7 to assist with any problems or questions you might have, and you'll even have the option to sell your artwork directly online to anybody that visits your site. That means you don't have to hassle with setting up your own complex e-commerce system. Start a website today and begin working towards your art career goals by going to squarespace.com for a free trial. And if you're impressed with what they have to offer, you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain by going to squarespace.com slash Proco.